Uh, this topic is incredibly important that we are about to discuss. Uh, this is this is the, the UKGC gaming report specifically that uh, my panelists are going to cover. Um, this report is has been designed on how to make uh, gambling a, a safer environment for our players. Um, this particular report, in addition to some of the others that have been circulating, are calling for much stricter regulations, which we all know could lead into a black market, which uh, we would like to avoid as much as possible. So we would like things to be done properly. In order to debate this issue, I am joined by three outstanding panelists. We have Jesper Carbrink of Green Jabe Games. We have Steve Donahue of Gambling Consultants and Tom Galanis of Tag Media. So, boys, let us start off by talking about some numbers here. Um, why is there this big call for tighter regulations? Has the number of problem gamblers increased over the years? Has it increased since the onset of COVID-19? And I'm going to have Jesper kick us off on this subject. Ah, thank you, and, and nice to be here. Uh, first of all, being regulated is, is key for a long-term sustainable growth in this industry. So regulation is a good thing, and, and it's also about canalization. Uh, and, and having read, the, read part of the report, I, I think the report in itself is, is a good thing. But, but looking at this one, I think we have to go back to the larger, larger picture, and you started with that one. Yes, we have around, depending on how you calculate, but in the UK, they say approximately 0.7% of, of the population has, has a problem. Uh, in Sweden, that number is 2%, a bit different de definition. And the interesting part here is that for us as casinos, it's not 2%, it's like 15%. So these players are coming to us. We t have to take this extremely seriously, and we are doing that as an industry. But then also we have to look at this from the border perspective. And, and it has been the same number for the last 20, 25 years. As long as I can have followed the, the, the report and, and the prevalence studies in Sweden, it's been around the 2%. So there are things, and, and, and if you look at the, the and in the meantime, gaming has exploded as a phenomenon. We have 24 seven availability. We have hundreds of casinos. We have hundreds of sports books. We have thousands of events all the time. We have marketing. We have sponsorships, et cetera, et cetera. It's still the same 0.7%. So the, and and for, for me, this means that we have to look at this problem from a total different perspective. It's not about the small things. And, and yes, we have slam stop and we have fast uh, uh, spinning wheels, et cetera, et cetera. We did have the same number of, of problematic gamblers when we didn't have these things. So for me, I think the key area here that I would like to discuss, let's say, is affordability checks. And, and the report is really raising this subject. And there are some really good initiatives out there. And I'm surprised why the regulator hasn't taken this as their responsibility. I mean, we see in Sweden how well spiel pass works when the regulator is taking an initiative like that and makes it to, to themselves. And everyone has to cope with that and, and join that. Why don't we do that with, with affordability checks? Because this addiction starts with money. If you spend more than you, you afford, then you have a problem. Before that, it's basically not a problem. I mean, this is not addiction where, where you only get hurt. Affordability checks, and with that comes mandatory loss limits that I set on my, on my individual level, and then scanner software like uh, Svenska Spears Play Scan or Mr. Green's Green Gaming. This should be the initiative of the regulators to run those as nationwide and regulating uh, uh, initiatives. So, and we see some of that in this report. Fantastic. Thank you, Jesper. Steve, can you comment on, on why this is happening and what the numbers are showing? So, let me first say, uh, as Jasper says, the numbers of problem gamblers have not basically changed since the first report was done uh, 15, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, what has changed is the political environment. What we now have is a anti-gambling lobby and an anti-gambling business, which has effectively captured the regulator, the government, um, and convinced them that we have moved from the situation which it was, 
which was problem gamblers are basically either born or created due to traumatic stress or due to having symptoms of other mental illness um, to now a public health approach, which is the belief that every single person is at risk of problem gambling. Now, I would believe that if the numbers had changed. We have doubled the size of the gambling industry in the UK, yet the numbers remain the same. So what this is, is political lobbying. Um, it's business, as in those people involved in the lobbying are looking for basically money from the industry. If you create a crisis, you get more money out of this industry. And unfortunately, what the industry has done is shot itself in the foot repeatedly with incompetence, amateurish lobbying, ignorance. We are finally, with the creation of the uh, Betting and Gaming Council, putting on at least a show of competence but we are a million miles away from getting to a position where we can push back. And my prediction is in five years time, big black market, half the number of operators, uh, land base even worse. And quite frankly, we'll have thousands of people out of jobs. No one in government will care. And a lot of the fault of that is down purely to the industry's own complacency and incompetence. Yeah, how are those? How about that? <laughs> Thank there you, you for being so frank, Steve. Okay, Tom, so <laughs> do you have anything to add <laughs> to, uh, to, to this topic? Oh, it's, it's always difficult following up from Steve. Um, uh, but just to sort of pick up on what on, on Mary's has said, and just to almost hark on some of the, the, the logic of why this has come about now, obviously, to, to alongside political lobbying. Um, but for me, there's a, there's a conflict going on between facts and feelings. And that sits within uh, within the industry and outside of the industry. Uh, you only have to look at the Lord's Gambling Committee uh, the other day and have Kelly, Kenny Alexander plainly, openly say that 99% of GBC customers will lose. They will be losing customers. Um, it's not a good word to be using. This is only we need to move away from winning and losing in, in this. Um, but the industry itself, uh, when it comes to using facts, kind of when we when we present this sort of, but not that particular fact, but we talk about problem gamblers and how it hasn't rise, hasn't risen, and that, that that may be a fact. The problem is facts don't mean a great deal in 2020, um, and, and when we market based on emotion, a lot of the marketing around gambling offers. And brands is driven by the emotive experience of placing a bet, enjoying the thrill of it, uh, which is, is true. Uh, it's a leisure pastime. It's an form of entertainment. Uh, and we can all sort of hang a hat on that when it suits us. However, we can't then lean on the data um, at the same time when we're having emotion, emotive opinions, if you will, being thrown back at us. So it's opinions versus facts in a time where opinions kind of do count more in terms of media coverage and press. And in terms of um, political equity, and unfortunately, that's, that's kind of where we're at. And um, I think the industry needs to do a lot more to embrace, you know, some of the issues being raised, because clearly they are tragic stories. Um, and these tragic stories were, were happening long, long ago, and they're not necessarily tied to, to any activity the gaming industry is doing new. Um, but things like looking at game design, um, affordability checks, as Jesper um, mentioned, um, yeah, uh, max wages on spins, speed of spins, all these things uh, may have some credence to them. But what they do need to be done is, is, is properly researched. My concern when it comes to reviewing the Gambling Act is that we're getting to a position where too much is going to be driven by emotion and not enough by, by science and data. Um, but at the same time, we have to appreciate and be compassionate to the stories that are coming through. Um, and from what I've seen in the BGC, that isn't necessarily always the case. Um, I get you know, the, the position that they find themselves in. They're being very strong and strong arming uh, what they would call pro prohibitionists. Uh, but we need to be careful with that because we are, in fact, losing a battle here as an industry. Uh, and that losing battle, you know, whether, whether we appreciate it or not, is being interpreted as damaging to the public health, uh, damaging to individuals. In the opening lines of the gambling 
of the Lords Gambling Industry Committee report focuses in on uh, children, um, problem gambling amongst children being some 55,000 kids. And that's nothing to do with the online gambling industry per se from, from our activities. It could be associated with sports sponsorships and whatnot. Um, but the problems actually stem from arcades um, uh, and, and obviously the National Lottery when you, when you factor in under 18s. Um, in a nutshell, more has to be done, but we have to be smart with how we rebut any, any approach um, to reform. Yep, I totally agree. And, and we don't have time today to go into all the details of these reports and the UKGC report specifically. Um, but for those in the audience that don't know, there are really three areas that the UKGC report focuses on. One is the VIP programs. They want us to make some changes to those. Uh, the, uh, the, the game mechanics, which are mandatory loss limits or you know, stake, stake limits, things like this, and advertising. Um, they want more of a smoking kills kind of feel to the ads than, than what we are showing now. Um, so what I wanted to know is who is coming up with these areas to review and how effective, generally speaking, do you think they'll be? So I want to start with Steve on this question, please. So what we have is originally not an overly bad situation where basically the Gambling Commission went to uh, the big operators and said, here are areas of concern. Will you do working parties on it? And so members of the big six, who are the primary funders of the BGC, and there are issues about that, which we haven't got time to go into, but they did working parties and came out with recommendations. Where the UKGC jumps the shark is they bring in this idea of expertise by experience, otherwise known as the lunatics taking over the <laughs> asylum, or just because I've had the flu, I'm therefore an expert virologist. What we do know and what you can guarantee with a group of experts by experience, and I have to point out, if it was a true group of experts, gamblers by experience, there would be 99 happy gamblers and one problem gambler. But no, we have a group of 26 problem gamblers who are all obviously negative against the industry. And what that allows the Gambling Commission to do is have on one hand what the industry is proposing and on the other hand, the experts for experience who are obviously condemning everything. And so the Gambling Commission then can easily choose whichever bit to take and come out of it as just the moderator. And it's bullshit. <laughs> right. okay. it is. yeah. It's bullshit. What we need <laughs> is science. What we need is research. What we don't need is completely biased dogma and ideology dictating how this industry, which serves the majority of the population incredibly well, you know, gets strangled. Very good. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> yeah, just. Can I just follow go up ahead, on that? Yes, please, go ahead. Look, to, 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 to get to the point really about the black market, I think this is, this is a really important one. Obviously, my background is, is in the affiliate space. And you know, part of the, 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 the overview and the review is going to focus in on marketing, as you pointed out. Um, and that stems from sort of VIP programs, clearly, and sports sponsorships. But there is obviously a call to license affiliates um, on the back of some perceived logic. Um, and affiliates traditionally across the world hold the gateway to new markets um so as we were traditionally find a gray market that is yet to regulate or in the case of the uk potentially if they get affiliate licensing very wrong uh, a gateway to a new black market in a regulated market um this is a, a concern of mine um and just to, to lean on steve's point you know my, my fear is that um, any regulation or, or around something completely new to the gaming commission although obviously they've been aware of what they think an affiliate is for a long time, is going to be driven by um, the experts by experience uh, and the political lobby that have earmarked affiliates as um, complete scum, uh, which is clearly not the case on the, on the, on the whole. 
the vast majority of affiliates are, are very good businesses. Um, my fear is that the licensing process will be too onerous uh, and potentially unaffordable for them. That's not to say they shouldn't be charged and you know, some of the success be, be taxed further, um, as all good regulation aims to do. Um, but the fear is that affiliates will have a choice. They will have a choice whether to go down that route or if they're small enough and perhaps not based in the UK, take the very easy step to go and promote those that are already making a bit of an imprint through affiliate marketing and through Black Cat search um, into the kind of operators that have zero focus and zero inclination to be responsible. Um, that is a huge fear. And, and what we might see happen um, is the expert by experience and the, the prohibitions, if you will, creating an environment where the gamblers that are trying to protect, like themselves, uh, end up in far, far deeper waters. Very a good black thing. market, sorry, a black market okay. serves the regulator. If you have a black market, if you're the regulator, A, it doesn't show up on your stats because no one measures the black market. So what you show is you've achieved your goal of reducing the number of gamblers. Great. You also have less work to do because there are less operators. Plus, all the troublesome gamblers are the ones who will go to the black market. So therefore, you end up with a happy situation of a black market, which everyone pretends doesn't exist. But what happens is the circular problem of they will then do a prevalence study and, oh, look, problem gambling has gone up because they've all gone off to the black market. Oh, well, how do we solve that? More regulation, more cost. Well, what then happens? We just get less operators. So we just end up in an oligopoly. And that's what the regulator wants. Arguably, it could be what some of the bigger operators want. Okay, so you think that's you've, a cynical you've, approach. It's very cynical. <laughs> but for the sake of time here, we only have a few minutes left. Um, yeah. it, but as an industry as a whole, we know it's very important to to protect those at risk and do what we can in order to avoid problem gambling. So, yes, but I know you are a firm believer and. And, and focusing on the individuals at risk rather than putting blanket rules, you know, across the whole entire industry or in the UK specifically. So can you tell us some ways, I know you touched on it earlier, um, on how we can do this? Yes. And, and let me start with, with me being a game developer today. And, and we, we, there are criticism about the games are going too fast and, and there are slam stop and things like that. And, and yes, you, we can take those away and, and we can still make good games. But these are a reaction to how society has developed. It goes faster and faster. We have more choices to make. I mean, if we take a car, if we take a, a sports car, a Porsche from the 1970s has a smaller engine than my standard Golf today. I mean, this is evolving. And, and trying to stop that from gaming is like trying to stop a tidal wave. It's impossible because this is what, what the regular player wants. They want to do in-game bets. They want to, to slam stop, et cetera, et cetera. And as we said before, this has this these are, are pretty new inventions and we had the same number of problematic gamblers before we had those inventions so, so it doesn't add up to, to to kind of take this this is the fastest route to move everyone into the black market because there, there is where the fun games gonna be this is like putting restriction on winemakers to make them make a bit less good wine and that will not stop the alcoholics from drinking of course not but everyone else will go to to denmark and buy the good wine or wherever you go to do that so and, and so for me, one, once again, you have to focus on the individuals about to become problematic gamblers. And it all starts with you spend more than you should, more than you can afford. So affordability checks. And, and come on, we live in the digital area. Doing proper affordability checks on a nation level should be super simple. We have the tax record, we have banks, et cetera, et cetera. And then we do mandatory loss limits. If I set the loss limit of 1,000 pounds a month and my income is 3,200 pounds, well, that should be a kind of a flag for this guy should not gamble. There's something wrong here. Or he has to show a record of actually having a, a big wealth somewhere hidden. I mean, if we do this, and then if we track those players with, with, with behavior tracking systems, that are, everyone has them today. And this is where the regulator should step up. And 
they should impose this. They should even drive them and operate them. If you had a nationwide affordability check, we wouldn't have any problematic gamblers. <laughs> there should be one digital wallet exactly. operated by the regulator. The regulator should do all affordability, should do all problem gambling stuff and let the operators do what they do, which is gambling. Yes, we and some of that, that, if I want to spend my limit with, within my affordability on one 200 euro bet per week, fine, that's my way of entertainment. Or if I want to spend it on 200 one euro bets or 2,010 cents bets, that's my way of entertainment. As long as I do this, I'm not sure that UKGC should have the wallet per se, but they should have the tools where me as an operator connect my wallet and do these checks. Mm. And, 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 and I mean, look at Sweden today. They impose the 5,000 krona per month deposit limit per casino. So a problematic gambler now had 25 accounts or 10 accounts or whatever. And, and then when that's not enough, they go black market. So yes, taking actions on the product and reducing the product is the fastest way to drive players to the black market. And we are in the digital era and the digital time where we could have affordability checks and loss limits being crossover all operators.